Hello, everyone. I'm uh, super excited about being here today. I think the topic is, uh, is uh, perfect timing for uh, where we're at in the market today. Um, obviously, we're, we're talking about AI and blockchain. Um, AI, blockchain, and the Internet of Things is the new social, mobile, and cloud. Uh, it's going to change. It's going to impact uh, all industries from the highest levels down to the smallest levels. And it, it, we are changes amongst, uh, among us. Um, it's going to have a bigger impact than the Internet uh, has, um, you know, has had over the past 20 years. Uh, I guess you have a little bit about my background. You know, obviously, I'm traveling all over the world to speak at conferences. I just spoke in Singapore, Thailand. Uh, in the Isle of Malta, which is one of the big hubs for blockchain. I met with the Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat. I have met with all the top people from the uh, Malta uh, Stock Exchange. Uh, so it's very, very interesting about how you know, certain areas are really becoming very, very popular. I'll be speaking in Barcelona uh, and Macau here shortly. I think we can start with just an overall view of blockchain. I think that to understand, you need to understand blockchain and how it came about. You know, blockchain came about after uh, the crash of 2008, where trillions of dollars in market value was lost across the globe. Uh, uh, trust was destroyed uh, uh, by the large banks, governments, and uh, large uh, corporations due to being inept, corrupt, or outright fraudulent. So due to that uh, destruction of trust, it opened up the window for blockchain. And blockchain has been exploding since. Um, I know that some people think that there's a downtrend in the ICO market, but if you look at the overall funding, it's, the trajectory is uh, significant. You know, it, uh, the increases in funding are over 100% year over year. But, uh, you know, the reason why the blockchain is so important is that uh, it, it's a trustless system. Basically, it, it provides a couple of things that are very, very significant. One is that it's uh, significantly less expensive to transact. Two is that it's more secure than a credit card or other means of uh, transferring money. Three is that it's completely transparent. Everybody knows exactly what has taken place, uh, it's, and four, it's in a public ledger or distributed ledger, which means no transactions or no uh, documents can be changed because of the ledger and the trail of the ledger and because of consensus. And because of that, now we're going to see a significant impact. Everything, the world is going to change, every, the world's gonna be taken over by blockchain. Every, every single transaction, every single record, is going to be recorded on a blockchain. And uh, that's going to be a very, very, very good thing. When you lay on AI, that's when uh, you're going to start seeing some significant um, increases in um, efficiency, optimization, uh, you know, usability, and all the other great buzzwords. But um, yeah, we're, we're seeing, I mean, on a global basis, we're seeing Asia, Europe, other parts of the world, they are off to the races. They are embracing this technology. They're embracing crypto uh, currencies. Uh, the governments are setting up exchanges, currencies to make this completely legal and uh, regulated. And unfortunately, the United States is lagging behind in a significant way, mostly due to the SEC and their lack of being able to uh, give any type of guidance or policy. They're, they're basically regulating through subpoenas, which is not a good way to be. The problem that we're going to end up with is that the United States is going to start operating at a significant disadvantage to the international markets, strictly because they have embraced blockchain. And uh, as we're trailing, uh, they're going to they're be benefiting from all the efficiencies and benefits of blockchain. But why don't we start off this discussion with uh, each panelist telling us uh, basically what's your role in crypto, uh, AI, blockchain, and uh, you know why don't we start there and then we can go across the board. How does that sound? Okay. Start off. 
that was loud. Uh, I am Rex Wong and uh, CEO of uh, Avon, which is a project that stands for AI Video Open Network. And we're actually using AI for uh, computer vision AI and machine learning uh, to basically get more metadata on video uh, and kind of build that out as a protocol of which uh, our first decentralized application will actually be a video search engine. And uh, I know a lot about search engines because uh, uh, the, the company called Applied Semantics, we did AdSense back in uh, the dot-com days, it was probably about the dot-com days. Uh, we actually uh, still power about 70% of Google's revenues and then we were using natural language processing to figure out semantic web and Basically, uh, in 98, we actually started a search engine, uh, but uh, it kind of worked after the dot bomb uh, and uh, became AdSense, which you know today is all those ads that annoy you on Google. Uh, and, uh, but uh, to the present day, uh, you know, right now there isn't a video search engine out there. And so really what we're trying to do is use AI to actually go for videos because right now when you search for videos, all the metadata is actually based on what users upload and users could game that system. And so really when you look at it, uh, you need something to go into the videos and that's what we use AI for. So think of it kind of like a meta crawler that goes into a video and you get frame accurate metadata on everything in the scene. So that's basically what we're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Rex. Hi, Carrie Sullivan, uh, CEO founder of Culminate Health, as well as the uh, principal founder of uh, Culminate Strategy Group. We do, uh, on my consulting business, we're a 1099 um, uh, consultancy that, that uh, marries uh, design thinking and uh, agile. Uh, similarly, we're very, very focused on um, data science and data science driven technologies. I've been building databases for 20, 20 plus years. Um, Culminate Health is actually a marketplace that's fueled by um, blockchain and AI to uh, do direct contracting between uh, mid-market and enterprise employers and healthcare providers cutting out the middleman. And it's good to see so many gray hairs in the room. I was, <laughs> I was sitting in, in Japan during the, the dot-com uh, bubble and bust um, uh, working for Capgemini Ernst & Young, so uh, it's it's good to see so much experience in the room. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tarek, uh, founder and CEO of Labor Crypto, also founder and CEO of uh, uh, Chorro Labor. Uh, my background has always been in, uh, in the workforce space, so when I came across the blockchain and cryptocurrency, it actually um, started allowing us to fix certain issues and problems that uh, a lot of these uh, ecosystem freelance marketplaces actually still, still struggle in from. Uh, as being doing more data and research, we found out that almost 39% of the world population is not even in part of these platforms. Now, um, the adoption of cryptocurrency or blockchain in general is not only create that uh, transparency and the trust, but also create the inclusion opportunity for millions and billions of people around the world to be able to uh, either consumers with a, an idea to see the daylight or an actual person with a talent just not earn uh, revenue. And we're uh, deploying AI in this system so we can make it, uh, the system will be able to automatically match the talent with the actual uh, consumers and, and make the actual user experience so much easier rather than having to go through the painstaking process. Um, like uh, if you go to Upwork or Freelancer.com for example, or, or any of these recruited platforms. And the other things that we do differently is we actually allow the actual users that create the value of the business to keep most of that value back to them by uh, a revenue sharing model. I think that's um, where our sweet um, uh, spot is at. Um, so as I said, I'm CEO and co-founder of Reucoin. Uh, we're a cryptocurrency and blockchain based platform and we, have, we let users wager on their own performance in video games. So we just did an equity sale and we're going to be doing a private sale of tokens and then we're going to release our platform and then do a public sale of tokens. So we're doing a token sale, ICO, um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how we fit into this ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, obviously that uh, AI and blockchain has uh, been 
big buzzwords for a long, long time, and uh, uh, there's been more conversations about it than it's been actually deployed into the market. And I think that we're starting to see a point at convergence to where that uh, all this rhetoric and theory um, between blockchain and AI are finally going to merge, and then we're going to start seeing some scale uh, within this sector. Uh, you know, several ways that AI can improve blockchain, and this is from the readings that I've been doing, is that more efficient mining, optimization of energy consumption, increased scalability, data sharing, help with detection of fraud, uh, uh, fraudulent activity. AI and blockchain combo can create secure, decentralized databases for highly sensitive information that AI-driven systems must collect and store. I think it's very, very important for AI to work. They have to have very, very, very clean, good, a accurate data. And I think that uh, blockchain uh, delivers that in a significant way. So I think that there's convergence there. A lot of the AI that I have been seeing that's actually deployed in the market is uh, around the trading side. Uh, you know, these people are trying to arbitrage between different exchanges and trying to figure out what's going to go up and what's going to go down. Um, I think that, why don't we start with this? I mean, if each one of you can explain uh, the specific problem that you're solving and how AI and blockchain uh, play into that role, I think that that would be a, a good spot to start. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, so we are obviously explain how we're using AI and on the blockchain. What we're using the blockchain for is several things. One is actually scalability. So actually down your list. Um, one of the things that we need if we're going to index a lot of uh, video is a lot of compute power, and uh, we don't have enough, or it's it's not cost effective enough uh, in the existing cloud systems that are out there. So we're using the blockchain to incentivize uh, users to participate and become essentially AI miners. Uh, so similar to blockchain mining, we use basically the same exact resources. Um, we use CPUs and GPUs, and you can modify ASICs to do it even faster. Uh, and so uh, what we wanted to do was go out there and, and, and get a bigger user base. And, uh, in terms of uh, existing, we actually have spun out of an existing business that uh, we already have 500 million users, so we can actually access that user base uh, and incentivize that. Uh, but the problem with AI is that it's also not 100% accurate right now. Uh, it's only about 70 to 80% accurate, and you might say that's good, but I'll give you an example. I use this example for like trans machine translation. If you're 80% accurate, one out of five words is actually wrong. So uh, that's just not good enough. Uh, so we need humans. And if you really look at AI, AI is like a baby. So when it comes out, it has an algorithm on how to learn, but it doesn't have a data set on what to learn. And so we need humans. So that's the second part of what we're using the blockchain for, is humans uh, to create kind of a mechanical Turk network to teach the machine learning uh, and teach that baby to actually learn and incentivize those users as well uh, to teach it things like, um, you know, what does George Clooney look like, as an example, or uh, is this nudity or profanity, uh, and then as well as translation and transcription. Uh, so these are metadata pieces that describe video, and without it, you can't search for it, you can't access it, uh, you can't find content. So that metadata is very important. Uh, and then we need to use, once we get all that data, because it's crowdsourced, uh, we need the consensus and, and the consensus to kind of make sure that everybody is honest and, and that the data is accurate. And so those are kind of the three different components that we use the blockchain for uh, to, to kind of verify all that content uh, and that metadata and make sure that it's accurate so that we can have a credible index. Uh, and then we use the immutability of the the record and ledger to track that and assign unique IDs to content because that's the other biggest problem for video and content is that it gets pirated and so uh, how do we know, you know, for content owners they want to make sure that the content reaches the user and it's not pirated and the user wants to make sure that 
uh, that's legal and advertisers want to make sure that it's brand safe. So these are other pieces that, that we utilize the AI and the blockchain for. So um, I don't think we have enough time to talk about what's wrong with healthcare at yeah. this point, um, <laughs> especially in the United States. So um, we, we focus uh, on B2B. Um, I, we're, not a, we're not a consumer play on the healthcare side. Um, we are specifically focused on uh, mid-market and enterprise employers that are direct contracting their health healthcare with uh, healthcare providers. And it's become a trend. Uh, you're seeing Intel, Walmart, Boeing, uh, General Motors was the most recent one contracting directly with Henry Ford Health in Detroit. Um, and they're doing that because it's an effort to control both the quality and the cost of their healthcare uh, in, 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 for their employees and improve the uh, overall uh, quality of life and, and health and productivity of their employee base. How, so, how, is, how is AI and blockchain so, working into that? So the way that we're dealing with it is um, by creating a marketplace and using blockchain to uh, and immutability to create the um, pricing and the things that change infrequently, um, pricing, PII, regulatory uh, changes, uh, things like that. And we're able to partition um, the, the personal data for humans and patients and others um, behind the blockchain and then leverage AI, machine learning, and our networks to do uh, heavier analytical work on large pools of data around healthcare claims uh, and um, behavior in, in medicine. Uh, so that we're, we're able to transact money, not necessarily on the blockchain at this point, uh, but we can at least try to uh, track transactions. So we're making, it, making the pricing simpler um, making negotiations simpler, making payments simpler, and improving cash flow for healthcare providers. Uh, and, and we do a lot of financial services work on the consulting side of the business as well. Thank you, Kerry. In fact, uh, uh, from what my reading, uh, medical and healthcare data is like one of the top things for AI and blockchain. Yeah, with the, with the way that we've built it, where we will actually be able to build um, an EHR or an EMR, if you remember like that term that's um, proprietary to the member um, and becomes an employee benefit. Okay. So. Thank you so much, Gary. When we look at the workforce system, uh, research has shown that almost 90% of people feel unfulfilled by the work they do. Some might be successful at what they do, some might be um, uh, making good money, but at the end of the day, 90% of the people aren't feeling fulfilled. And then when we look at the history of the freelance marketplace, it's been growing in a rate that by 2029, it will bypass the full-time employment opportunities. Uh, large corporations have already been outsourcing a lot of these works overseas, uh, undercutting uh, all the expenses and the payrolls. And applications that we start seeing like uh, Upwork, Freelancers, Fibers, these are generated more than a billion dollar revenue each a year, but they, they lack from what I like to call them five major problems with the industry. Uh, one of it is the high transaction fees, anywhere from 25 to 30%, even consumers has to pay for the convenience of the system, which leads to the second problem, because of the financial system that we use in the fiat currency, it could take anywhere from two business days to almost two weeks if you're paying someone over in, in uh, India, or Pakistan, or China. And the fact that we're even talking about a fiat currency, we're already excluding millions, if not billions of people to even to get into this space. Uh, we're talking about consumers that don't have access to credit card or even workers that don't have a bank account. And we've seen this even running our business here in the U.S. Truly, if a household marketplace, think of it as a, a Uber for household services. We've seen that there's a lot of people that actually don't want to get into the workforce but don't have a banking system. It, I mean, we live in the 21st century where we still have to depend on certain things to make to make a living. Uh, and, and this is where the sweet part of a cryptocurrency and blockchain comes to play. It opens the gate, the floodgate for everyone. So anyone, it, it's democratize the opportunities. It doesn't matter what, what part of the world you live in. And, uh, and then the fourth problem that we've seen with these marketplaces is they're, they have a really poor user experience. I'm not sure how many of you have used any of these platforms in the past, but you found it very difficult. Every time you go there and try to post a job, you have to go through the vetting system yourself. And this is where we, where we see the, uh, the AI and the collaborations between the actual workers can comes into play. Every time consumers come in and post a job, you're building some, you're giving some data to that, to that software to understand what kind of, what, what predict what's your next um, uh, idea or next 
piece of your project that needs to be fulfilled and start a lot of put that you know help you connect with workers in that space that can help you take your business to the next level. Um, the fact that we're using blockchain and opening up the gate to so many much more users, back to your point, is we do need a lot of data to fulfill that AI in order to, to actually start um, educating itself and then performs at a faster pace. The fact that we get in a lot of these data comes sooner than later, then we can have that software up and running faster sooner than later. And the last but not least, the biggest problem with any of these industries in general is the user loyalty. There's a reason why we see consumers or workers jump from one platform to another. I mean, there's no stickiness. And the reason why, I mean, uh, they're, they're not being able to compensate for it. Not the fact that they just have to give away a big chunk of their revenue, it's, it's a barrier. But what we see that could be solved in the form of the tokenomics, and this is where we, we feel like you know, tokens really revolutionize the way how we look at a business. And you know, there's a three cornerstone to any business, regardless what it is. We have the consumers, and we have the workers, and we have the shareholders. The consumers, they care about a great user experience, perhaps you know, cheap or free. The workers, they want to get paid for what they, they do and love and go home. And the shareholders, all they care about is the return of investment. Now, everyone has a different interest in this business. But if we take the exact same business and we tokenize it, now to use the protocol, we need a token. And because you have a token, you also capture the appreciation resulting from the action of the whole entire community. And that's what this turf into to the big guys, is we finally seen people working together rather than against each other and creating this field of competition with each other. So to use the protocol again, you, need, you get that token. And because you have it, you capture appreciation resulting from the action of the whole entire community. So uh, anything you do will benefit the community. Everything anyone else does will benefit the community. So even though you're, you're joining the space as a... Okay. Yeah, let me ask you a question. I mean, are the workers willing to take tokens instead of cash? Yeah, a lot of, I mean, people now when we start building our platforms, they don't even want to take cash or PayPal. They're like, I, mean, I mean, I know that they'll take Bitcoin and other things that yeah. are super liquid, but yeah. uh, I mean, do you think that they'll take the, the coin that you issue? Or, or are, you, are you planning on hanging them with a, with a yeah, so, more popular coin? So what we're doing is, yeah, we're obviously doing it on a, our own ICO uh, in the process. So the our token will be the form of payment in, in the exchange. Um, and eventually, as we create the value to the ecosystem, we get the, co the, co the coin in the hands of you know, the, the, the users. Um, that, that have the liquidity and the cash value to it that can be traded in exchange or could be even traded in terms of a value between each other. Okay, thank you. Sure, so to explain the problem solving, I'll start with how we came up with it. Uh, my friend and I were playing video games after college, uh, after classes one day in college, and uh, Wyatt, who's now my co-founder, challenged me, and he said that the loser of this game would have to make the winner breakfast. Uh, and we realized that that game was made much more exciting just because every shot mattered, and the low stakes wager made the game more exciting. And we realized we could share this experience with other people, um, but when we looked at the technology that existed for this exact, uh, this exact problem, the only company that we found doing it is, they're based out of California, they're off blockchain. Um, and if I put $10 into the system, skills system, and I won $1, that $10 can be sent back to my PayPal, but that $1 sent to me in a check in the mail, it takes four to six weeks to get to me. And if I ever have a dispute on their platform, if there's some arbitration process that takes 30 days. So for, for us, for blockchain, if there's three benefits. It's more secure, it's faster, and there's no need to trust us. Um, every, uh, every transaction is secured by the NEO blockchain we're building on NEO. And essentially, the two players wager, and the, the wagers are held in a smart contract, and the oracle, or the way that the smart contract knows who to pay, is from data reported directly from the video game itself. So there's no need to trust the system. Um, and we can technically pay out winners within, with the, within 15 to 20 seconds, uh, but we hold on to it for 30 minutes because we have a dispute mechanism where we have arbitrators throughout our ecosystem who we pay with our cryptocurrency. Okay, thanks. Is there, uh, is there an AI play into this? Um, I mean, we, 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 it's not fundamental to our platform. AI is not fundamental to our platform, but we have AI elements. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the future of uh, the, you know, the industries or the sectors that you're in. Obviously, I'm an evangelist. I'm, um, uh, uh, you know, super, super positive on the space. I think that, obviously, blockchain and cryptocurrencies are going to take over the world. It's going to be a bigger change than the internet itself. I see that uh, we're going to uh, start seeing this mass adoption and mass institutional investing uh, come into the market over the next couple of years. Um, I guess I have one shameless plug. Uh, 
I have uh, one company that I'm involved. I mean, the biggest issues with blockchain right now is that, especially with Bitcoin, first, it takes 10 minutes to settle, uh, which, you know, for e-commerce, that doesn't work. Uh, number two is that um, um, it is, uh, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, I mean, there's security issues, especially when you have young people, I mean, uh, novices trying to set up the system. Uh, third is that, you know, obviously there's only certain, uh, there's certain, uh, it's hard for people to understand exactly what the dynamics of the market are. And uh, fourth is that accessibility. I mean, how easy can uh, people actually use the system? One of the coins that I'm involved in is Futura Coin, FTO. And what they're able to do is they're able to transact immediately, worst case scenario, it closes in four seconds. Number two is that they have a wallet that's very, very easy to set up. Number three is that they've developed a ATM machine that'll be global, that where you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies um, um, you know, on an ATM. You can buy, sell, or, 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 or convert it into, uh, into cash. But uh, I see the, I see, you know, 20,000% growth in this market minimum over the next, I don't know, seven to 10 years. I think that this is the beginning of the beginning. It's 1995 or 1998 in the internet stage. Uh, probably 1998 if you're in Asia or Europe, 1995 if you're in the United States. But I'd like to see, hear everybody's uh, vision of the future, uh, you know, in the markets that you're in. Well, for us, uh, what we are actually also, uh, trying to drive is uh, there isn't there's a lack of uh, searchability for video, and video is now 75 percent of all internet traffic. Uh, but if you look at what's happening in the space, uh, I give you an example: uh, Disney uh, last year announced that it, it's actually taking all their content off of Netflix and launching their own platform, uh, and. I think in about three years, uh, Netflix won't have any content that comes from the studios anymore because they themselves are a studio now. Uh, and all the other studios look at them as a competitor. So in at least in our world of video, uh, what's happening is that, in fact, uh, uh, video is actually decentralizing because content is going to go to all these sites. And so Disney will have a site and, and uh, Warner Brothers website. So if you want to watch Game of Thrones, you go to HBO. But if you want to watch uh, House of Cards, you go to Netflix. But if you want to watch Marvel, you go to Disney. Uh, and so the traffic is starting to decentralize. Uh, but how do you find content? Uh, and when we first started this journey, we kind of looked at uh, decentralized YouTube as a concept. Uh, but the problem with that is that people don't go to a content uh, uh, site based on how you pay. They actually go based on the content. And if none of the big guys are going to put content on that platform, people are not going to go. Uh, and so content is going to all these, these different types of uh, sites and that's fragmenting. So what you need is a central place to actually find content and search for content. And so what we saw was the need for very good video search and the base of that is very good metadata. Uh, and, uh, and so if you look at a search engine uh, like Google, it's centralized. But one of the biggest problems that all these guys have, like Disney and, and all these media companies, these big content owners have, is that uh, all the power of the internet is being centralized amongst very few tech giants. Bang, here in, 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 the, in the Western world, or Bat, uh, Bat being Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent in, in China, right? And so those few giants, uh, the Facebooks and Googles of the world, they control 75% of all internet traffic. They control 75% of all data. We saw that with Cambridge Analytica and all these data breaches. Uh, they control 75% of AI technology. Um, and they, so they control a lot of things. And a lot of companies don't want to go to a central giant tech power who might also compete with them. So if Google has AI, but Google also runs YouTube, and Facebook has Facebook Watch, uh, and with Netflix, the whole reason why Disney got off that platform is because 
sure they were making a lot of money, but they were losing their identity and they were losing the data. So, and if you look at what Netflix did is originally uh, when it started, it had all this data from all these studios. And from there, they could figure out what people were looking for. And they started then becoming a studio and buying content uh, based on the data that they saw. So like last year, they spent $500 million and cornered all the stand-up comedians in the market. Because they said, wow, that, our data shows that stand-up comedian content is very hot. And so let's do that. And that's data that none of the other studios are getting. And so they realized that, geez, you know, we might be making a lot of money there, but we're losing all the data and identity. Can, can I, uh, how do you monetize this model? Uh, so what we saw was that, you know, most people think search is, YouTube is a video search engine, but YouTube's actually just a hosting platform. And YouTube doesn't have, uh, it can't find what it doesn't actually have, and none of these studios are putting on there. So essentially, YouTube is, is a big index of user-generated content, and that's great. A lot of people like that content, but that's the long tail. And how do you find uh, all the hit content, because it's all being fragmented? And so what we realized is that you still need a central place to go and find and search for content, but if it was controlled by a tech giant, or somebody that was doing it for profit, then nobody would want to put any of the data on there, right? So this is really what we see is that you need the decentralization and, and, and the decentralization power. And, and how do you monetize that? Uh, and how you monetize that is from the metadata, we've actually developed native types of advertising, so not pre rows that are based on the metadata. So things like interactive hotspots that you can click on to commerce uh, and digital product placements. These are things that are not invasive and engaging and interactive, yet if you don't want to be bothered, they won't bother you, and they're based on the contextual relevance of, of the metadata. Uh, and so kind of look at that as our AdSense to our video. Right? Thank you so much, Rex. I think I spent five years telling Tribune to stop giving all their content to uh, Google and Facebook for exactly that reason. Yes. Um, and consider consumers. Um, I launched um, the the, mo the least popular product I think I've ever launched in my career was the subscription digital subscription for Tribune, um, and it was a heck of a lot of fun and really interesting. But nobody wants to pay for content on the internet, so we've got to change that paradigm. If, if people want good content, we, we've got to we've got to start to pony up because if the advertisers are paying for it, we get what they want. So uh, off, my, off my soapbox on, me, on media. Um, so for, for healthcare, the way we're monetizing um, and thinking about it. Well, to, I mean, it, it's the future, your the future okay. vision of the market, and then you can talk about how you monetize. Okay, too, okay. all right, I'll, I'll take it in order. Um, future vision is um, a, a place where we, where we're solving fundamentally an economic problem. Um, healthcare is paid for in different ways by the government and by employers. Um, and, and the government is paying for it in a value-based way where there's an expectation of quality. On the employer side, there's very little expectation or accountability around quality. Um, and the, the negotiation is done uh, behind closed doors on arbitrary discounts and arbitrary charge masters um, from the healthcare providers. So we need to make the negotiation much cleaner, much simpler, um, and essentially get rid of the uh, infrastructure that's been built up over years and turn employers back into actuaries. They used to employ um, armies of actuaries in large companies, and that, that practice went away in the 70s and 80s um, when they gave up that, that um, control over their data and, and over their money to insurance companies and third-party administrators. So, well, we're gonna, we're gonna automate those folks in the middle, um, and we're gonna, we're gonna collect money for that. Uh, on a membership basis and uh, on a sliding scale in the transactions because we don't necessarily want to be about big transactions but our service is about volume. Uh, so we actually want to reduce the volume and improve uh, employee uh, quality of life. And, and Can I ask you a quick question? Is, how open are these healthcare providers or whatever, wherever you are in the chain about, uh, uh, about deploying blockchain and AI? Um, so when you talk to a provider and you say, I can get you paid within um, uh, within a, a few days, not within a few months, 
there's a gigantic bit of interest in that. Uh, they're less interested in going toward quality and value based, um, but there is definitely a uh, trend toward toward that that, that approach. All right, thank you, Karen. The way we see um, the future of work has changed. The vision of the, the vision of the market going vision forward, market. and then and then how how you monetize the model. Right. So what we see is we've seen um, uh, the trend of people jumping the ship of full-time employment to be a freelancers, and the numbers are growing as not uh, astronomically. Uh, like I said, you know, Harvard Study and McKinsey have shown that by um, that in 20 years from now, about 70 to 80 percent of the jobs as we know them today will be completely uh, replaced by either some form of a automation, machine learning, or robotic. But what sometimes I find it ironic is I see some of the investors investing in the self-driving vehicles. Knowing the fact that the whole purpose of using a vehicle is to, to travel from home to work, but we've seen the work actually is going to be from home rather than having to commute. So um, I think some some of those uh, uh, funds has to be uh, kind of routed to to uh, different goals, the long term goals. Especially when we talk about livelihood of every individuals. Um, our vision of the future, or our vision when we jump into this space, is we want to make sure that the actual people that created this, this value of this network should be compensated for their time, tension, and data on top of their labor work as well. Um, the, the way we monetize this is we, um, we obviously don't charge a big transaction fee. We go with 3% transaction fee. This way, the, the actual workers can get to keep max, maximum of their, of their um, earnings. But we also um, have an option for the actual consumers that have some sensitive project that wants to get it in the presence of as many audience as possible to boost it. Facebook post boost, and then for the freelancers to be able to, if they want to position themselves in the top list of the 90 or 100 bids that comes to that particular job, they can do that. The other way is, as we get to the critical mass uh, users, we can start uh, deploy some some form of um, advertising in the ecosystem. And at the end of the day, the way we incentivize all these users is all these forms of revenue that we generated, 50% uh, of it can be given back to the active active users, consumers, and freelancers alike, based on individual contribution. Kind of like how credit card system works. You know, you you swipe a card, you earn points, you can redeem those points. But the other thing that we see for the future workforce, which hasn't been actually addressed by any of these existing platforms, is they don't. Act, we know that the technology keep evolving, and some of these clients they come in with some set of skills or certain technicality they need for the project. But these freelancers they can't go and buy those or afford to to take those courses or certificate that costs thousands of dollars. And we feel like. It's our role to kind of get that uh, partnership with some of these institutions that uh, further provide those, those form of education so that we can get that whole sell price and pass the savings to our uh, freelancers, create an ecosystem. Sure, can I ask a question? Uh, what do you think the catalyst is going to be to where that you're going to be able to dislodge these major brands and entrenched interests to move over to your platform? I understand all the I mean, it seems like you, you have a lot of different attractive features, but obviously there's going to need to be some sort of leading catalyst that is going to, you know, get the sea of the, the, the sea of change that you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, it's it, again, um, we just need to have, give it a little bit of time. There's, a, there's barely less than one percent of the people even um, into this space in the blockchain and cryptocurrency. A lot of people have the spe speculations of. Uh, I don't want to get paid in crypto. This is doesn't mean it's not safe. It's not secure. But I think we will see a huge adoption when we start talking about blockchain in general. I mean, when you send an email, you don't say I'm sending SMTP IP or I'm, I'm sending like a text message as uh, TCP IP. We just say text message or an email. I think when we get to that point where uh, we stop using those big words, cryptocurrency, blockchain, we're going to see much more adoptions. And I think Apple is already getting people used to using their phone as a form of payment where they just. Uh, scan their devices close to an actual uh, uh, ATM. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. The so, vision of uh, the market and uh, how you monetize it. Sure. Yes, we have to do it quick. I, we're the beginning to flash that, that time yeah. a couple of times. I'll go quickly with you. <laughs> uh, so for blockchain gaming, I see three main ways that it's going to move forward in the future. One is the decentralized exchange of in-game items, meaning if I win a gun in Call of Duty, I can use an exchange and sell that for a quarterback and mad it. Um, two, I think wage, wagering and tipping uh, video game players who are professionals who you watch online. Um, and, this, and then I also think uh, skill wagering is the third element. Uh, two uh, issues and hurdles I see in the future. Uh, one is the accessibility, which you talked about. 
Uh, to buy one of our tokens right now, you have to put money on Coinbase uh, and then send that Ethereum, and then buy Ethereum with that, send that Ethereum to an exchange for NEO, uh, and then send that to a, sh a separate exchange to exchange for our token, which is just it would, it, totally untenable for any kind of video game user who's just trying to use our platform. Um, so that's gotta, that's gotta improve, which I think it will. The more fundamental issue, I think, uh, the bigger hurdle is that blockchain is great at cutting out the middleman, but if you think about where you get your video games, I get a lot of them on the App Store or the PS Store. Um, it, it, blockchain is technically good at cutting out the middleman, but they're not gonna list our games if they're not making money on the in-game purchases. So some sort of revenue share with the uh, content dis distributors. I know there's one company who we met in Hong Kong who's trying to do the Netflix for games um, on Android phones, but an issue they run into is you download their, a game on an Android phone off their platform, it gives you a security warning saying this, this content was not vetted. So I think those are major issues moving forward. On how do we monetize? We take a 10% fee on every wager and we split that with the video game developer whose game was on.